Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 103. This is a great psalm. I like this one a lot. We're going to start at the beginning. Psalm 103, starting at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. I mean, we could stop right there and just praise God for it, huh? Look, I mean, all the things he does, we're going to go on, but to he pardons all your iniquity. I mean, he forgives everything you ask him for. He heals all your sicknesses, redeems your life from the pit. I don't know about you, but I've had times when I felt like I was in a pit. And I was always grateful when he pulled me out of it. He pulls you out of that pit. There's no need to stay in there when Jesus is around. Crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. And satisfies your years with good things. So your youth is renewed like the eagle. Getting younger every day. Let's go on. Verse 6. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. Why would judgment be a good thing for oppressed people? Because sometimes the oppressors need to be judged. And God takes care of that too. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He doesn't, he's not mad at us. I think the main thing to take out of there is he doesn't treat you according to the bad things you've done. He just forgives. He doesn't hold a grudge. He doesn't say, yeah, okay. Remember five years ago what you did? No. He forgot it already. He forgot five years ago. He chooses to forget. We need to learn from him. Just like a father has compassion, he has compassion on us. He knows, he knows we're but dust. Yeah, he knows we're human. He knows what we're capable of. He knows we mess up and we need help. And he's right there to help us. It's a wonderful heavenly father. Let's look at Psalm 34. There's a lot of good things in here today. Talking about the goodness of God today. We've been talking about in the last couple of weeks about what God is like. And today we're simply focusing on his goodness. Psalm 34, let's start at verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him, there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Several good things in there to focus on, but basically, look, he delivers you from fear. It keeps you from being embarrassed. You know, when I look to God and I ask him for help, I can count on him doing it. I'm not going to be embarrassed for saying, well, God will help me here. No, he does what he says. He says, never ashamed. How many times I've taken that verse and said, Lord, you said, I'll never be ashamed for trusting you. Right now, it's not looking great. And he says, okay. And he takes care of it. You cry out to him and he answers. He protects you. He provides for you. I mean, what more can you ask? Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
let's take a, a look at a couple of verses in the New Testament concerning Jesus. You know, Jesus was the exact representation of the Father. Hebrews tells us that. So let's see a couple, just a couple places where Jesus shows the goodness of God. In Matthew chapter 9, verse, starting at verse 35. And Jesus was going about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And seeing the multitudes, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw the people were in trouble. They're distressed. They're wandering around. They don't know what to do. And he already had an answer prepared for them but look at the verse before what did he do he was going around teaching them he was proclaiming the gospel what was he doing um he said it in the one place they show he was uh quoting isaiah 61 the spirit of the lord is upon me for he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor bring deliverance to the captives recover your sight to the blind to proclaim the acceptable day of the lord he was proclaiming god sent me here for your sake and he not only told them that then he healed them Jesus had an answer because he saw these people were a mess. They didn't know what to do and where to go. He provided an answer. And look on to the next chapter, the first verse, chapter 10, 1. It says, and having summoned his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Why do you suppose he did that? Because he knew there weren't enough people hearing what he had to say. And so he told the 12, you go do the same thing I'm doing. These people need help. And there were no cars and planes and nothing like that. They had to walk or ride a donkey. And so he just sent out 12 more people. You go do the same thing I'm doing. Gave them the same authority. And they went. Why? Because of his compassion. Because he couldn't stand to see the people's need. He was that eager to help everyone who came to him. Matthew 14 is another example. In Matthew 14, it tells about how John the Baptist was uh, murdered, and he was. Remember, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And Jesus was all man as well as all God. Imagine how upset you would be to hear that your cousin had their head cut off. I mean, yeah. So Jesus, it says here, he went away from there to a lonely place by himself. Probably just wanted to get quiet. Took the disciples, went away somewhere lonely, hoping to be quiet a minute. But verse 14 of Matthew 14 says, he was in a boat, of course. When he went ashore, he saw a great multitude and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. Jesus laid down his own needs. He saw those people and he thought, these people need help. I'll take care of me later. And he healed their sick. And he took care of them all day long till nighttime. And in the nighttime, he fed them on top of it. I mean, he took care of these people, even laying aside his own need. Another example of God's goodness, which many might think is strange, but it's a very important one, is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Psalm 25, verse 8 says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Now, what do you think he's telling sinners to do? Repent. What else should a sinner do if they want God's help? Should we make excuses? Should we say, well, God, I couldn't help it because, you know, and then that guy over there, he did it too. Mm -mm. He tells you, no, you want help? This is what you do. You repent right here. I'm ready to help you. That's the goodness of God. Similar one in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? King James says the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It is his goodness that leads you to repentance because he sees your mess. He knows you're in trouble. 
He knows the only way out for you is to repent. Turn around. Repentance simply means I'm going one way. I turn around and I go the exact opposite way. I'm living in sin. I'm being selfish. I'm rebellious. And I say, I'm sorry, God, forgive me, please. And then I turn around and I start living for others. And I change the way I think and the way I talk and the way I act. Repentance. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. You know, the very people that nailed him to a cross, they were spitting on him and, and hitting him. So they were hitting him with their fists. I mean, they were, they were beating him up. They did horrible things to Jesus. And then they hung him on a cross afterwards. But when he came off the cross, he was ready to forgive him. And right before he died, he said, Father, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive him. Why did he do that? So these people would have a chance to repent. And anybody who accepted that, that was standing there that day saying, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus said, forgive him, Father. Anybody that accepted that forgiveness got it. That's the mercy of God, huh? You know, Saul was on the road to Damascus, ready to go lock up Christians in jail. He'd been persecuting the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He thought he knew what he was doing. He thought he was so smart, yeah. And on the way to Damascus, he ran into Jesus. A big light said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? Lord? Many say that's the point of Saul's conversion when he called Jesus Lord. He said, I am Jesus who you're persecuting. Now go on to the city and I'll tell you what to do. He went into the city. Long story short, in the city, he found out what to do. All right. He repented. He repented. He was baptized. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul, the Saul, the persecutor, became the apostle Paul who wrote a good part of the New Testament and brought the gospel to many, many people who didn't know the mercy of God, the mercy of God. You know, he could have just said, forget that dude. I mean, a lot of us would say that. Forget that guy. He's over there persecuting the church. Just throw him away. God doesn't think that way. He doesn't throw people away. He didn't say that person is so down and dirty. I'm not doing anything for him. He says, come here. Let me help you. The goodness of God. I think sometimes we need to remember how much we deserve hell. If I can say it that way. You know you deserve it and so do I. But the mercy of God saved us from it. Not a one of us deserved God's forgiveness. But he's so kind and so good. He gave it to us anyways. I mean that ought to keep us grateful the rest of our lives. In Romans chapter 5. Verses 6, starting at verse 6, it says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Helpless. What does he mean we were still helpless? I mean, we couldn't change ourselves. We didn't know how to change ourselves. But right then, in our misery and our sin, Christ, Christ died for us. Isn't God good? Some more examples of God's goodness. Let's look at Psalm 33, verse 5. 33. Here we go says he loves righteousness and justice the earth is full of the loving kindness of the lord the earth is full of the loving kindness of the lord you notice it doesn't say the earth is full of all the bad things the devil is doing the earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. It's a matter of perspective, guys. We got to learn what to look at. There's stuff around us. There's plenty of things around us to get us upset. Wouldn't take much to look around you and find something to get upset about. Find something to get irritated, something to be mad. Forget that. God doesn't want us to look that way. He says, look at this. The earth is full of my loving kindness. What is loving kindness? Love and kindness. I love you and I'm good to you. I'm kind. To you. That's what you got to get your eyes on. Look at me. And let go of all the rest of it. Psalm 23, 6. Similar. The image we talked about last week, I believe. Psalm 23, verse 6. 
Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. King James says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and loving kindness. Man, I need that mercy of God. I need that loving kindness of God. I need that goodness of God. Follow me just like a dog. You ever have a dog follow you around at your heels? And then you turn around one way and the dog is there. And you turn the other way and the dog is there. The goodness of God is like that. And why is it right behind you? Because you might need it. You might say, God, I really need some help here. And goodness says, okay, I'm right here. Here I am. Ready to help you. Following you. Following you all the days you life. Not misery. Not disaster. Not whatever bad things you want to say. No. The goodness of God is following you. If you're a child of God. Waiting to help you. Here's one you probably don't read often. Nahum. In Nahum... Chapter 1, verse 7. Just read that in the board. You probably won't find Nahum very fast. Okay. Nahum 1, verse 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who take refuge in him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. When you're in trouble and you don't know what to do, you go to your good heavenly father. And you say, help me, father. And he says, here I am like a chicken where he's in her wings and pulling all those chicks underneath. She take, he takes you under his wings and says, okay, nobody's touching you. You're safe. I got you. That's our God. Now, you might ask yourself, why is this an important subject? I'm telling you guys, this is more important than you think. It's because sometimes we get confused about where good comes from and where evil comes from. Sometimes even Christians who've been with the Lord for a long time start blaming God when bad things happen. God, why did my baby die? God, why was there, why were we in a car accident? Why did, there, why was there a tornado? Why was there a hurricane? Why was this? Why was there violence? Why was it? We need to know where that stuff comes from. Let's look at one more time. John 10. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Where? Who comes to steal? Who comes to kill? Who comes to destroy? The thief. Who's the thief? The devil. The devil is there to steal from you. He's trying to kill you. He wants to destroy you. Every time you see that in life, it's him. It's never God. God has no evil. He has no bad. He has no sickness in heaven to give you. He doesn't cause bad things to happen. The devil does that. He's in this world, and he has a right to work in this world through people who listen to what he has to say. People who don't know God, and they just let their emotions go, or they do whatever it is. You know, go get drunk, and then drive a car, and then hit some innocent person, that kind of thing. That was somebody yielding to the devil, listening to what he said. And causing trouble, right? In James chapter 1, this is a verse worth meditating on. I'm telling you guys. It's worth taking time to meditate. You know, again, meditation, take time and think about it. James 1, verse 17. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. What does it mean? Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above. It's from above. It's from above. Every good thing is from above. The devil will never do anything good for you. I don't care how many people that worship the devil say that he does good things for him. Wrong. That's a lie. He can't. He doesn't know how to do good. He only does what did he, will we say he does. Steal, kill, destroy. That's the devil. The good things, they come from our Father of, Father of lights with whom there's no variation. He doesn't change his mind. He didn't decide to be good to you today and then tomorrow. Well, I don't know if I want to be good to him anymore. Mm -mm. He's still going to be good to you tomorrow and the next day and the next day. That's what our Father's like. This is so important, guys, because, again, when problems happen in our life, if we give in to our flesh and to our emotions and we start saying, God, why did you let this happen to me? The devil just has a great time. He just sits back and laughs and goes, oh, I did it. But they think it was God. Good. Let them blame God, you know. Mm -mm. It wasn't God. 
It was the devil. Let's not blame God for what the devil does. We got to know that we know that we know God is good. He's always good. He's always ready to help you. And we got to give him a chance. Sometimes we get so caught up in ourselves, we don't give him a chance to help us. Let's change, huh? Let's let him help us when he can, when he wants to. John 14, verse 18 says, let that one go. There we go. 14, 18. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Why did Jesus say that he was about to be crucified? The disciples were going to be alone. They weren't used to being alone anymore. They were going to be desperate and fearful and locking themselves in the room. And he's telling them, guys, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I will come. I will come. I will come. You ever have to say that to your kids? Kids, don't be afraid. Yeah. Wait right here. Mommy, be right back. Daddy, be right back. Just stand right here. I'm not leaving you alone. Well, God says to us, I'm not leaving you as an orphan. Why? As an orphan. Because an orphan has no one to protect him. An orphan has nobody to provide for him. An orphan has no one on their side. But we're not orphans. We are not fatherless children. We have a heavenly father. He's looking out for us all the time. He's ready to help as soon as we cry out to him. That's our good heavenly father. Psalm 27. David realized this. Psalm 27, he said, I didn't do it there. 27. There we go. Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have despaired. And thus I had believed. Do you believe you'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? I'm not talking about in heaven. Yeah, we know it'll be great in heaven. I'm, I'm happy for heaven and all that. And, you know, seriously. But right now, today, he said, I will see his goodness right now here. I would have despaired. If you're, if you're tempted to despair, remind yourself, wait a minute. Wait a minute. God said, I'm going, you're going to see my goodness here. And this here and now, the goodness of God is there for you. A similar verse, Jesus said, wait a minute, no, Psalm 34, 19, we were already in 34, but one more verse out of Psalm 34, verse 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. We shouldn't try to fool ourselves and pretend there are no afflictions. There's no hard times. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. It says it right here in the Old Testament. And you know what? Jesus said it again in the New Testament in John 16, verse 33. He said it again. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Let's be real. In the world, you have tribulation. If Jesus said it, that's the way it is. But he didn't stop there, did he? He said, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Okay, there may be hard times. But Jesus said, I have overcome the world. That's why I'm telling you guys, you should have peace. You should be courageous. I'm here. I already won the battle for you. You don't have to figure it out on your own. I've already overcome the world. Isn't that a good word to have? One more. Psalm 46. Verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change. You know, the earth may be changing, guys. The world around you may be changing. It's changed a lot in my lifetime. But that's okay. God hasn't. God hasn't changed. Again, as I told you, I told you a while back about the story of 
my grandmother who stood over my grandfather's bed in the hospital. And the doctor said, might as well go on home. He'll be dead within a couple hours. Just go plan the funeral. And, and he's, he's, he's dead. There's nothing left to do. And she looked the doctor in the face and she said, I know a bigger doctor than you. And I'm going to go talk to him. And so she went and prayed. And that bigger doctor than her answered her prayer. And raised my grandfather up off of that bed. And he lived another mm, probably around 50 years. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. God raised him up. Why? Because she cried out to him. And that same God answered my prayer when I cry out to him and say, God, help us now. And when you cry out to him and say, God, help me now, he's still there. God hasn't changed. The world might be changing. Things around you might be changing. Okay, let's not be afraid. Jesus said, don't be afraid. I've already overcome it. I already took care of it. Isn't that a good God? Don't you just love him tonight? Because he's so good to you. I really want us to take these words to heart. We got to remind ourselves because the world is a bit turbulent right now. But God's not. He's got it all under control. He got it all figured out. So let's just thank him together for that. Thank you, Father, that you're so good to us. Thank you, Father, that you care about us so much. Thank you, Lord, even though there might be tribulation, there might be problems, but Lord, you already overcome it. You've already won this battle. It's not a problem anymore. So I faith, we can look ahead and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that we're coming through. We're coming through whatever it is, and we're coming out the other side, and we're going to be better off than we are today. We're going to be stronger than we are today. We're going to know you better than we do today. We thank you, Father, for the good plans you have for each one of us, Lord. Father, help us to hide this word in our hearts, to make it part of our lives, part of the way we think, part of the way we act, and the way we speak. In Jesus' name we ask it now. Amen.